Good afternoon, class. This is the practicum point I was talking about where we are going to switch software from QGIS to Grass GIS. So uh, the practicum today kind of had a little bit too ambitious of a plan, so we're going to scale it back a little bit. And basically what we'll do is we'll just go over some real introductory concepts on how to use Grass GIS, how it's a little different than QGIS. And at the end, I'll just show you some tips for going back and forth between QGIS and GRASS in terms of a, a workflow that you could decide whether or not you want to adopt for Project 2 or the other projects that will come up uh, you know, throughout the semester. What I will say is I want to reiterate the uh, thing I mentioned in class on Tuesday, which is that the philosophy in the open source world is uh, that a piece of software should do one thing and do it the best. And of course these pieces of software do more than one thing, but they definitely have their strengths and weaknesses. So I would urge you just to give uh, native grass a shot just to see how it, how it works for you because there are some advantages for doing your entire workflow within grass. Uh, and once you sort of wrap your mind around the differences between it and a, and a typical, more typical GIS uh, piece of software, like QGIS or ArcGIS, you may find that you actually prefer the uh, philosophy of grass, which I certainly count myself in that camp, which is partially why I am uh, asking you to give it a go. But first things first, you gotta get uh, a new little bit of canned data. This is data that you'll use in project two and you'll use for the next several practicums in a row. Um, if you're on the Google Drive, you can go into the projects folder and find project two and you'll see the description for Project 2 and the download file. So to download this file, you can just right click on it and then uh, download. And it's a zip file, so you're going to have to unzip it. So by default, uh, on this computer in the lab, it's just going to put it right into um, the downloads folder. Um, just a quick aside, I actually have made all the project data available on GitHub. Uh, which is a uh, sort of open online repository for mostly for code, but you can put data there too. So the other place you can get this stuff is from my GitHub uh, page, which is, you know, my username is Isaac Ula, uh, slash GIS dash projects. And then you see all the stuff and you can actually download all the data here in one big zip file. You'll have all the data from project one, two, three, four in a row. Uh, one thing to note is that the uh, inside these the project descriptions are probably a little out of date because I uploaded this data a couple years ago and I have made some updates to the project description fo uh, files that I keep uh, mostly just for you here in the class. So <clears throat> that all aside, let's go. Uh, let me minimize my web browser and go find my uh, downloads folder and you'll see project2.zip. So what you're going to want to do is to, uh, you can unzip this directly in here if you want, and on these lab computers you just right click and extract here, and you'll get a, a folder called project2. And inside that you have a grass data folder and a folder called database codes. My suggestion is to move it out of downloads and put it somewhere intelligible. So this is uh, my, where I have my QGIS projects. So instead of putting it in there because this is now a grass project, I'm just going to put um, the whole project 2 folder over here in the sort of parallel to where this is. So all of this is in here. So you'll have to go into this folder called database codes eventually. And uh, w when we get to that, I'll talk about what these, these codes are. These are just for you to finish project two. But the main data folder is this one called grass data. And if I sort of get this uh, in parallel with uh, the QGIS projects folder, you'll kind of see some uh, s similar organizational principles. The main difference between grass and QGIS is that this data structure has to be this way and grass will manage it itself. So I'm giving you this sort of canned uh, grass data folder for you to get started, but initially you would start grass up with a blank folder and you would import all your data and it would create all of these folders that you're looking at. So there's really no reason for you to ever have to go in and look physically in your computer's file browser 
at any of these uh, files or folders because Grass will know where they are and it'll pull the data in automatically. But I just want to show you how, how I sort of paralyze the, the um, manual way that you organize your data with rasters and vectors in a, in, inside your project projects, SPV survey for an individual project, and then raster for your rasters like that, and uh, vectors for your uh, vectors like that. So we did that manually. Over here, this is what Grass does. So we have Grass data, which is this bigger folder here. All your Grass data, no matter where you are in the world, what it's about is going to go in here. Inside that are folders called locations. And we have just one location now, but you could have as many as you want. I happen to have named it something intelligible, which is Hasa, which is the place in the world, Wadi Hasa. Uh, WGS84, which is the uh, which is the datum, and then UTM, which is the general projection zone 36 north, which is the actual UTM zone. So whenever you're making new grass locations, super easy to just name them uh, with information that helps you remember where and what projection and all that kind of stuff. And the reason you want to do that is because all the data that's going to be in this uh, location is going to be projected into this exact CRS system. Um, you can't have lat long data in this. It needs to be reprojected into UTM zone 36 north. Okay, so we'll get to that in a second here. Inside that, you you can have another series of folders. These are called map sets in the grass, uh, you know, terminology. You have to have at least one, and by default, it will make it called permanent, and it has to be all caps. And then you can have as many other map sets as you want. And I'll cover this again when we open up grass. Inside the map set, there will be a whole bunch of folders. They'll have names like cat cell, etc. These are actually where all the data is. And Grass, to be very efficient, is breaking up the data into little chunks and storing them in these in these different folders. And you'll see there, you know, the names will repeat in multiple type um, in multiple uh, folders. That's all just actually one raster data file, and Grass is doing all of this management, so you will never have to actually look at this. I'm just giving you a little sneak peek behind because that's useful for you when you uh, when we talk about the next step, which is how it actually looks in the Grass software. So importantly, we have a Grass data folder. Now let's start up Grass, and uh, if you're on the live computers, you can just click over here, and it will start up like so. And uh, we are using Grass 7.6.1, which technically isn't the latest version of Grass, but it is the one that will play nicely with the version of QGIS that we are currently using, which is 3.4, the stable version of QGIS. So the latest version of Grass is actually 7.8.2. It has a few additional extra features, but it's not like light years beyond 7.6 for the things that we want to do, so this is totally fine. You'll get a, a little error message that says, Grass needs a directory, a Grass database in which to store its data. Can you please find it? And what you want to do is to point it at this Grass data folder. So click Browse, and then you go to wherever you saved it. Uh, we happen to put ours in Project 2 in Grass data. And you just want to highlight it. You don't want to click through it. You want to make sure you're on this page, and you just highlight Grass data and click Open. And there, Grass knows everything about what's below Grass data. It knows all your locations, and within each location, it knows your map sets. Now, if you wanted to make a new location, you can make new blank ones. You can uh, make new ones based on uh, other data, and I'll show you that uh, at the end of this particular practicum. So again, a little bit more aside for Project 2, but it's important for you to know how to do that. Uh, at this point, though, what we want to do is actually create a new map set and the reason why we want to create a new map set and I'm just going to call it mine test you can call yours whatever you want is because grass will automatically save everything that you're doing into the current map set and the good practice is that you put all your base data files your your raw data files in permanent and then you do all your work in another map set and then you have no danger of accidentally deleting some of your base data. So it's always good practice to just set up a, a second map set even if you're doing something pretty quick. And you can always tell it that you want to look at the data from permanent while you're in test, but it will always, whatever you're doing, save it in the current map set. And also won't let you delete things that are not in the current map set. So it's a little bit of a safety safeguard. 
At this point, you can hit Start Crash Session, um, and then it'll pop up like so. And somewhat similar to any other GIS program, you get kind of two main views. This is a map display window, and then this is your layer manager, and also has all of your tools. So whereas QGIS was one big solid menu with these things sort of attached to each other, Grass gives them to you as sort of two separate windows. Um, you may not like that, but it is what it is. Uh, you can resize them, you can move them around. I find it to be useful. Um, also now in the Grass map display you'll have this red box and this is the current region extent. And this is something that's different with, than QGIS. In Grass, you explicitly must tell it the north, south, east, and west sides of a window in which you want to do any operations. Now you can automatically set this to match the size of your map, but maybe you don't want to do your process on the entire map. You just want to do it on a little bit and it will be much more efficient. So you can zoom in and set the region to match just that. And now conveniently it shows you in this red outline where you have the region set. And this is something that people who are new to grass often uh, get tripped up about because they haven't explicitly set the region. It's set to like one pixel down in the bottom left corner or it's set to the whole world and it either doesn't produce anything or it, it takes forever to do anything because you're actually trying to chug through a bunch of empty null cells for you know the entire western hemisphere or something like that. So. Uh, you'll see at the top of the map display just some, some of the same basic zoom and pan tools, very similar to QGIS. Over here, the, a few, there's a, a slightly different philosophy in terms of this compared to the QGIS layer manager. This gives you a lot more uh, functionality, I would say. So the first things you want to look at are these little icons in this row right here. And these are your basic add layers. Here you can add a raster map, and here you can add a vector map. So we'll click on that, add raster map, and it brings up a little module. Everything in grass is modular, so everything you do will usually pop up one of these little modules. And it'll say name of raster map to be displayed, and it'll give you a list. And we just happen to have only one, so select that one. And you'll see that it says at permanent because that map is actually in the permanent map set, even though you are in test. Okay? So you can just hit OK, and you'll see, boom, it shows up over here. And this is a single map, and you'll see it fits our boundaries. And if we were to zoom out, which we can do with the tools, or I can use my mouse wheel to scroll, we can see how that red box perfectly lines up to match the uh, map. So you have a lot of options for, uh, you know, for zooming. So I would just say explore these, uh, return to previous zoom, zoom to the full extent of the currently selected map layer, and then you have a couple other specialty tools which I'll get to in just a second. Okay, let's talk about vectors now. So we go back over to here to the map layer manager and we'll click on the add vector map. And we get a similar thing, it's called d.vec, now all of these weird names, and name of vector map to add. And now we see we have two vector uh, site, uh, files and these are again in the map set permanent even though we are in test, we can get it. So I say whs sites and click OK, and then you see a whole bunch of black exits. Now to style that, uh, you can either double click or right click and go to properties, and you're in that same d.vec, it's the same thing when you first added the thing. But you'll see there's all these tabs over here on the left, and if you go through you can see how you can change the color of all of your um, you know, points, I'm just going to hit apply. And it's the same, it's very similar color wheels, you can select from a list here, or you can enter numbers very specifically over here. So it's pretty straightforward on how you change the color, uh, you know, to any color you want, which that green looks really terrible on our particular background, so I'm going to set it back to red, like so. Now, if you want to change the uh, actual symbol from an X to something else, you go down to Symbol, and where it says X, you click and you've got a series of basic symbols or you can get a whole bunch of extra funky symbols. Uh, there's all kinds of weird symbols in here that you can choose uh, from, but uh, typically you just, let's say you want to turn them into circles, click OK and apply, and there we go. Now when we go back to our colors, you see we set the line color, so when it was actually just an X, it was only line, so it turned the whole thing around, but the dot is actually, or the circle is actually a 
circular line with a area fill and so you can set the area color as well and you can change that to anything that you want so let's set it to green it's probably going to look pretty terrible uh, but there you go like super hyper neon <laughs> the inside and the outside and you could set this to be red as well and then it would make a solid red dot you could also set it to be transparent it'll make hollow dots so you have some pretty good control over just how you display things here in the in the map display uh, there's a few other things in here that you can explore um, if you want to show this in the legend or not a legend I'll show you how to put the legends on the map here in just a second so you can do all kinds of stuff here so you can explore around in that and uh, importantly at the very bottom of all the modules is a manual and if you expand this you can actually get a whole bunch of help uh, and you can read very specifically what all the options do. So every single thing in Grass has this nice built-in help. And if you get lost, you can kind of read through these help manuals and, and figure out what it is that you, you know, need to actually put in for that option. So uh, by default, that uh, raster map we put under, which is a digital elevation map, an elevation file for this region of southern Jordan, has the default color scale, uh, which is called Viridis. It's uh, similar to the one we were using in QGIS. To change that, again, right click and go to properties, or you can literally just double click and you get that same D.Rast. And uh, over here, uh, oh, actually here, you can't change the colors directly from D.Rast. Instead, what you could do is uh, manipulate the, dis the uh, values to display. So if I wanted to cut it off at sea level, because the Dead Sea uh, Valley is in the upper left over there, I can actually put 0 to, and then the star means infinity, and I can hit apply, and you can see it cuts it off there at, um, at sea level. Now, I don't particularly want to do that at this moment, so I'll just turn that back. If I want to change the colors, i got to right-click on it, and then go to Set Color Table, and I get R.Colors. And here, what you do is make sure you have that raster map selected, and then go to the Define tab, and Name of Color Table. You get a whole bunch of cool color tables that you can pick. This happens to be uh, an SRTM, uh, which is the same one that we, uh, similar to the one we downloaded for Calabria from the USGS site. So you can decide, maybe you want to set this to the default SRTM color scheme. Hit Run, and there you go. So you may like that better you might not. Uh, you can play around with as many of these kind of color things as you want from a solid uh, color scheme like so uh, to one that kind of goes across the spectrum of the rainbow. Uh, just depending on what you're trying to convey you can choose whatever color that you want. Um, I think the Veritas one that we started with is actually pretty good so I'm going to set it back to Veritas like so. So that's just basic styling, just catching up so that we can see we can everything we could do, you know, in terms of map styling, just basic map styling we can do in QGIS, we can do the same kind of thing here in Grass. Now let's say we want to add things like north arrows and scales and legends and stuff. Well, that's all here in the map display, and it's all under this add map elements button up here on the right. So here I can add a scale bar and I can uh, choose the kind of scale bar I want. Uh, I'll just keep it at classic. It can change the number of segments, so I just want four segments. I could change the labels and the font size and the colors and all of that kind of stuff. So, and I can, uh, at this point, add it to the map and uh, you know, it's mostly the default values now. Now to move it around in the map, what I can do is select this little arrow and now I can just drag it and put it anywhere I want, which is pretty cool. It's pretty flexible in that regard. And let's say I want to add a north arrow. I can choose the style of north arrow that I want. And again, it puts it here. I can, making sure I have the arrow selected, this little arrow tool, I can just click and drag it and put it wherever I want. The other thing I can put on here are legends for the vector or for the raster. And I'm just going to... Uh, put the basic legend here and what I want to show you is that if I add now a second vector in our case we have the other set of sites WHNBS and I'll change their colors to be let's just do dark blue 
and transparent fill and I'll set the symbol also to be that same circle. When I hit OK, you see my legend automatically updated, so now I have two. And if I want to edit this legend, I can just double click on it, and I can come back here and let's say I wanted to set the background color. Uh, I can hit display legend background, and now I have a white box, basically with a black outline around it. And finally, let's say I actually, and this is a lot of map elements, so you may not need all of these, but I want to add a raster legend. I can do it for my SRTM, and by default it puts this little color scale over here. So now I know these are elevation, and if you play around with it, you can actually add a title, like so, and you can see I added elevation, and as you go down, you can add the background, like so and there you go and now I can expand this to be the whole area and drag everything around and reposition them the way that I want them and at this particular point I can actually save out a figure pretty easily if I right click on this actually one thing that you can do is resize it so I want to make it uh, longer and skinnier or a little taller or something like that I can do that right here and make it smaller and fatter. You know, there's all kinds of uh, things that you can actually do, like so. Uh, so play around with that kind of stuff and see how it is. And you can put your north arrow down where you are. But when you're ready to save this out as an actual graphics file, up here it says Save Display to File. Click OK, and then you can save it somewhere here. I'll just save it right in Project Two, and I'll just test map. It's going to save it automatically as a PNG. So if I minimize this and I go back here to project 2, here's my output graphics uh, folder and file. And again, this is it. Everything that we were actually just looking at. And depending on how you've got things arranged uh, on here, things are going to show up uh, differently. So, uh, and if you get everything lost, you can just get back into it, you know, into the module add scale bar and then um, you can kind of move things around again like so boom right and then if you want to get this away remove scale bar remove legend and now I want to zoom back to this map I can just right click and go zoom to selected map and uh, oh whoops this one right here zoom to select a map and there we go I'm back at that view Okay, let's talk about the region, the grass region extents. Uh, the reason why this is important is later on when we talk about doing actual math, actual operations in grass. Maybe you don't want to do it on the whole Wadi Hasa tile. Maybe you just want to work on this little area up here. So what you can do, the simplest way to do it, is just to zoom in to where you want until you're happy with the map extent. And then over here in this little various zoom options, Go down to where it says set computational region extent from display. And now, if I zoom out, I'm just using the scroll wheel, you see this red box. Any operation that you do, any map algebra, any copying, any buffers, anything that you grow or, or manipulate, any new maps you make, it's only going to be constrained within that red box. It's going to ignore everything outside of that. Now, this is super important because if you set your region really small, like just a real small area over here, uh, and I do that. I have to know that even if I, uh, you know, enter some stuff for data over here, it's only going to try and do it in this little corner, and there's going to be no data in the output map over here. On the other hand, if I zoom way out like this, and I set my computational region, you see it actually has set this huge, um, big red area. And so I'm going to do math, and it's going to try and do math in all of this blank area. So it's going to take a lot longer, because even though there's no data out there, it's still a pixel. It's just a pixel containing uh, a null value. And it will try to do the math on all the pixels in this big blank area. And it will just go slow, 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 slow. So it's super simple to make that mistake if you don't know what you're doing, which is why I'm taking the time to explain it now. Now let's say we want to reset the region to match exactly the extent of our Wadi Hasa SRTM. 
Simple, right click over here, set computational region from selected map, and all of a sudden our, we're back to doing that. And now when we do math, we'll do it across the entire Wadi Hassa uh, map space. Okay? All right. So those are some real basics, and we'll touch on a lot of these again as we go through the next series of practicums. Uh, the only other thing to note is that all the power in grass is actually up here in these tools. And we're going to learn about a lot of these tools as we go forward, but today we're going to start with just one simple tool, which is to draw buffers of a certain size around our vector points map. And what I want to do is I'll start with the Wadi Hassa site, WHS sites uh, vector map. Let's right click on it and take a look at, uh, at the table. It says show attribute data. And we get this table, which is very similar to the show table in QGIS. And you can see that there's a series of uh, data points in here, including site num uh, max L. That's the maximum length right the maximum length uh, and then we have maximum width so that's a useful thing if we want to have a variable sized buffer so we'll just keep that in our mind I'll put the table down here in the corner uh, when we want to do anything uh, in grass any calculations in grass we go up to our menu in this case it's a vector operation so we go to our vector menu and then we have to find the actual tool that we want to use and here we have buffer vectors, it's just right here, but some of them I want to point out are actually like buried under these sort of side menus. They also all have names, v.buffer. What that means is that if you want, you can tap here on the bottom, there's layers, console, I can type v.buffer over here and I can hit enter and it will pop up immediately. So you can see I have two copies of the same module up here. The other thing I can do is go to this modules tab, and this is like a, a whole map to all of them. And I can find it in here, and I can double click, and I get it that way as well. And finally, there's uh, a Python interface. If you know the programming language Python, there's a whole Python interface. You can do things from the command line over there if you really want to. So there's a variety of ways to actually get your um, modules to pop up. But that's a little bit of an aside just for you to know. We're working with v.buffer. By default, because I have this layer highlighted, it shows up here. If you don't have any vectors highlighted, nothing will be here, and you have to go here and select the one. And again, you'll see they're in the permanent, but they're also currently being displayed, so it gives you a little shortcut for the maps that you're currently looking at, which is useful. Name of output vector map. That gives you the first clue that you're going to be making a brand new data file. This one's going to be saved in our current map set test. Not in permanent, but in test. So here we're going to put WHS buffers 20N. So I'm going to make 20 meter even buffers around all the sites. Uh, and then we'll go to the distance tab and we'll put buffer distance along major axis in map unit and I'll put 20 and it's going to be meters because we're in a UTM uh, CRS and the default uh, map unit is meters. So now we're going to hit run. It's going to give you some information and it will have loaded our uh, buffers sites over here. So I'm going to bring it to the top and I'm going to uh, turn off our other sites so you can see. So 20 meters is actually not that big, right? They're really small buffers. So let's make another one. We can go back up here to our tab at the top, which is required tab, buffers 20 meters, let's go 200 meters, and I'll go back to my major distance and I'll hit 200, and then I'll hit run, and we'll see we have a new map over here, it's what WHS buffers 200, and we can see they actually blend in with each other, um, and that's the default behavior of the buffers, is if they start to grow into each other, they join into a single polygon. And if I bring it down below the 20 meters one, we can see there are two separate fault files. And uh, when we go to add new, whoops, add new vector, we can see that now we have these two that we just made in map set test, and our original sites are still in uh, permanent. Okay, so let's say we didn't like the 20 meters one, we want to delete it. We don't have to worry about having it in the map set. 
To do that, we go to the File menu, and we go down to where it says Manage Maps, and delete g.remove. And this has a couple safeguards in place. Firstly, you have to tell it that you're only looking at vector maps. Then it will give you the list of vector maps. If you don't do that, you won't see anything in here, right? So I only want to look at the vector maps. I don't want to accidentally delete a raster map. So here we go. We can select our map. If we hit Run now, it'll say, nothing removed. You must use the force flag. And this is like kill switch engage. If you don't click this button, it's actually not going to do anything. So now we do it, and the buffers are gone. And we can close G, remove. And if we try and display, we'll get an error because we still are, have that thing in the layer manager. So we have to right click and remove it from the layer manager. And now it's totally completely gone. And if we go to add a new uh, vector uh, layer, you can see it's fully and totally gone. This is permanent. You can't go back from this, which is why there's so many fail safe switches, right? It's also the reason why I want you to keep uh, your map sets separate. If you were working in permanent, you could accidentally delete some of your base survey data um, if you're just sort of a little imprudent when you're doing that operation. Okay, so here we are back in VBuffer. One last fun thing. Uh, let's go back to our required and we'll change our uh, buffers output map variable size. And to do that, we'll go to, uh, I'm just going to make this a little bigger so you can see it. We're going to delete 200 from the major distance. Then we'll go down to here where it says name of column to use buffer distances. And uh, in order to do that, let's see, we need to go to the selection and change it to layer one, which means it's going to get the data out of the table. And then we can go in here and pick max L. And remember, this is the maximum diameter, and the buffers actually take a radius value. So it's 200 away from the site in all directions when we put the number 200. So if we do it just like this with scaling factor 1, it's going to take the diameter across the site and go out that far. So it's going to make them twice as large, basically. So here we'll change the scaling factor to 0.5 a half, right? And when we hit Run Now, we will see that some of our sites have very big uh, buffers. Let me turn off the 200 meter ones and some of them have very small buffers. Now this giant one over here is actually a Roman road and the maximum length is very long because it's a road. So if we don't like that, we can actually overwrite this file without having to delete it. So what we'll do is go back to our distance tab and instead we'll pick max W, which is maximum width, and then where it says optional, we'll put allow output files to overwrite existing files. And if you don't select that, so let's unselect that and hit run, it'll say, sorry, the output already exists. If you want to overwrite it, click this button here. And now when you run, it'll overwrite that original one and it will update back there and you'll get a little bit more of a sensible looking map over here. Now, let's say we really did want the maximum uh, length. So we can do that here. Uh, and we hit Run. And we just want to exclude this guy over here. So what we can do is to click this uh, query uh, raster of vector maps, making sure our buffers variable is selected. I can just click on this. And I get a little query tool up here. And uh, it ought to, oh, you know what happens. I didn't copy over the attributes. Transfer categories and attributes. So let's hit run. So now the whole table is going to be copied into that from the original uh, vector file. So I click on this, and now I'm only highlighting that guy. And uh, it'll give me some information about it under the attributes tab here, and particularly the cat number, which is the category number. It's a unique ID number assigned to each. Uh, uh, item in the table. So I can go over here and uh, I can particularly uh, select or deselect that one through a series of queries. And what I can do if I want to include everything but that one, I can put like 0 dash, this is 384, so I'll go 383, and I'll put a comma. 385 
bash, I think I can just put star. And let's see what happens if it doesn't give me an error. Yeah. So now I basically ran this on everything except that particular one. Uh, and I think maybe I just needed to put like, which is a big number, like 3 million or something over here. So instead of star. There we go. So now I did this operation on every site except for this one. And now I have a sensible map where I'm just excluding the one crazy Roman road with a very long length from it. And there's a variety of other ways to do selections. I'm going to wait to talk about these SQL queries till another practicum. Um, so that's some basics in grass. Just uh, click around on everything. Remember, everything has its own help, uh, help page. So again, vector. But v buffer, and I can go all the way down to the manual, and then I can read about all the input parameters, and they often have very nice, like you know, graphics in there to help you figure out what's going on. So that's really helpful in grass. Uh, so let's leave this up here in the background. I'm just going to minimize everything, and let's talk about um, if I want to work with grass data from QGIS. So I'm going to just start QGIS, and I just have to show you a couple of things, okay? So in order to do advanced processing, you need a couple of tools here. First, you need to turn on some uh, plugins. So manage and install plugins, and it'll connect to the internet just to figure out, you know, what the state of the online plugin repository actually is. And all the computers in the lab have been set up with the GRASS QGIS plugin. So once this thing does its business connecting to the web, I should uh, be able to show you uh, how to turn that on. So what I will do is, oops, is pause the video while the internet reconnects, and then I'll come back when. Okay, so that was my Wi-Fi not connected, <laughs> but here we are. We have the plugins uh, actually showed up here. So by default, the, it shows you what's installed, and you'll see Grass 7, it, but it's installed but not turned on. So you can just turn it on, and all of a sudden you're going to see some things move around in the background because there'll be a bunch more uh, interfaces for you to interact with. Um, just briefly, I want to show you, if you go to the All tab, uh, you can actually start searching. Uh, for things um, and one useful one I'm losing my internet again uh, so I want to talk about this and I'll talk about this in a future video um, one useful one is to add like open street map data behind your maps but we'll deal with that in the future okay so here we are uh, we have the grass plugin loaded that gives us the full grass tools all the um, So all of these tools that are in these menus, you can actually access them from over here. Um, uh, and in order to get that to show up, you probably will have to go to the, um, where is it? Somewhere here, there's like a, there it is, processing toolbox. And there they are. They're going to show up a bunch of grass tools over here. Okay. So it just sort of opens up a new window on this side. Uh, firstly, though, you'll see this over here, Open Grass Tools. Uh, and then you'll also see, uh, where is it? It adds a connect to grass data layers somewhere up here. Pause for the cause again. Sorry, that was just a little brain fart there. Uh, <laughs> it's here under Plugins, Grass, Open Map Set. And what you want to do is to browse here to your Grass Data folder. Just highlight it so it says Grass Data. Hit Choose. And now you can see the locations in the map set. So I can open up my test map set again. I can click OK. Oh. And if I have it currently in use, it's not going to let you do it, so it doesn't want you to be editing the same map set 
at the same time. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll actually um, file quit grass GIS. You can choose to um, save a little project file at this point. I don't tend to do it in grass because it's super easy to add my layers back. But let's say you have everything styled and you like it. You can hit yes and under project 2 you can just put proj2 and it's going to save it as a, a grass workspace so you can get back to right where you are just like your QGIS project file. Okay, so now let's go back to plugins, grass, open map set, uh, test, and then ah, here we go. So now we have an interface into our um, our actual grass data and we can start to interact with it in uh, much the same way we were doing from within grass except we're just using the QGIS sort of um, interface I guess so here we can add a new where's my new grass layer should have showed up used to show up over here display current region grass modules another pause this is often difficult uh, to keep in okay so I as soon as I pause that I totally remember what you have to do you have to go up here in the browser window the file browser window you simply have to navigate to your grass data folder and to your it'll show up now as as the map set and location and now you can actually just straight up add your your maps into your display window and you can uh, zoom to those layers should be able to zoom to those layers and view them there it is uh, so essentially what we're doing now, there's a little bit of a lag, um, which I find annoying, which is why I don't typically work this way. But what's really cool about this is that you have access to all your grass data, all your grass tools, and you have access to any other data that's out there on your computer, and you can start to work with them. The danger again here is that when you start to do that, you have to be in control of all your uh, projection issues, all your region extent issues, and um, all your data directory issues where you're going to save the outputs of all of this kind of stuff. Uh, but, you know, maybe you like working this way a little bit better, and uh, that's cool. You can do that, uh, you can totally do that. Um, as you like. Uh, it's up to you to choose which way uh, makes the most sense for you. You can see that there's going to be some difference in terms of the actual interface, uh, but you know, I'll leave that up to you to decide how you actually want to do that. Okay, sorry for the slight disjointedness of uh, this particular practicum. I'm going to stop it at this and um, We'll come back next week and we'll dive a little bit deeper into